Chapter 17, Moisture, Clouds, and Precipitation. Changes the state of water. The heat energy is measured in calories. One calorie is the heat necessary to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. Latent heat is stored or hidden heat. It's not derived from temperature change. It's important in atmospheric processes. There are three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. To change state, heat must be absorbed or released. And the processes to go from one state to another are evaporation, liquid is changed to a gas. It takes 600 calories per gram of water or added. It's called latent heat of vaporization. Condensation, water vapor or gas is changed to a liquid. Heat energy is released. Okay, 600 calories per gram of water is released. That's called the latent heat of condensation. Now melting, solid is changed to liquid. It takes 80 calories per gram of water are added. That's the latent heat of melting. Freezing, liquid is changed to a solid. Heat is released. 80 calories per gram of water are released. That's called the latent heat of fusion. Sublimation, a solid changes directly to a gas. For example, ice cubes shrinking in a freezer. 680 calories per gram of water are added. With deposition, so water vapor changes to a solid. The frost in the freezer compartment of the refrigerator. Okay, heat is released. Okay, so here's our diagram. Okay, so over here we have our solid ice, there's our liquid, there's our gas. So sublimation, ice going from solid to gas, it takes 680 calories are released. Okay, and take from um, water vapor that's in gas form to be deposited as a solid, it needs to absorb 680 calories of energy absorbed. Okay. Now melting and freezing. 80 calories to either absorb to melt or 80 calories are released to freeze. In terms of evaporation, it takes 600 calories to absorb or 600 calories released for condensation. And you notice that the 80 on this side plus the 60 on this side, 600 on this side, after the 680 to go from solid um, to a, directly to a gas. Humidity is the amount of water vapor in the air. Saturated air is air that's filled with water vapor to its capacity. Now the amount, the capacity of the air to hold water vapor is temperature dependent. Warm air can hold more water vapor. Water vapor adds pressure, and that's called vapor pressure. It's added to the air. To measure humidity, a mixing ratio is the mass of water vapor in a unit of air compared to the remaining mass of dry air often measured in grams per kilogram. Relative humidity is the ratio of the air's actual water vapor content compared with the amount of water vapor required to reach saturation at that temperature and pressure. Okay, so this relative humidity is expressed at a, as a percent. Saturated air content, so the amount of water vapor in the air is equal to its capacity. That's 100% relative humidity. Relative humidity can be changed in two ways. You can either add or subtract moisture from the air. Okay, so adding moisture raises its relative humidity. Removing moisture lowers its relative humidity. Okay. You can also change the air temperature. Lowering the temperature raises the relative humidity. Okay. We reach dew point temperature, temperature to which a parcel of air would need to be cooled to reach saturation. If air cools beyond that dew point temperature, then moisture is going to be released in some form of precipitation. So, relative humidity changes at constant temperature. So here, for example, where we have 5 grams of water vapor and 1 kilogram of air, and the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. So, um, at 25 degrees Celsius, the water vapor could hold up to 20 grams, but there's only 5 grams. So we take the 5 and divide it by the 20, which is equal to 25%. So the relative humidity this first flask is 25%. Okay. So now we add some water. So now we have 10 grams of water vapor, still 1 kilogram of air, and still 25 degrees Celsius. So 10 uh, divided by 20 is be 50% relative humidity. Okay. The air can hold 20 grams, but it has 10. That's half of what it could hold, 50% relative humidity. Here we've added 10 more grams of water vapor, so now we've got 20 grams of water vapor. The flask um, at 20, 
the one kilogram of air at 25 degrees Celsius can hold 20 grams of water vapor. So 20 divided by 20 is going to give you 100% relative humidity. Now let's see how relative humidity changes um, when we're changing the temperature. So here we have one kilogram of air with 70 grams of water vapor. At 20 degrees Celsius, it can hold 14 grams. So 7 grams divided by 14 gives you 50% relative humidity. Now we're going to drop that temperature from 20 to 10. Now the air can only hold 10, 7 grams, and there's still 7 grams of water vapor. So 7 divided by 7 will be 100% relative humidity. Now we're going to drop that temperature more, down to 10 degrees Celsius. I mean, 0 degrees Celsius. At 0 degrees Celsius, the air can only hold 3.5 grams of water vapor. There was 7 grams. Well, what's beyond the 3.5 has been um, changed to liquid, precipitated out. So we have 3.5 grams of liquid water at the bottom of the flask, 3.5 grams of water vapor, and the air at this temperature can only hold 3.5 grams. So the air relative humidity is 100%. Okay. The dew point temperature, cooling that air below dew point causes condensation, such as dew or fog or cloud formation. Water vapor requires a surface to condense on. Okay. Now, over the course of a day, um, our temperature might start might uh, be decreasing after midnight, and then once the sun starts coming up, our temperature increases till we get to the warmest part of the day, and then then the day starts to cool off. Well, relative humidity is highest when their temperatures are coolest. Okay, so we have more moisture, um, more more moisture to air capacity. And as the temperature heats up, it can hold more moisture. But unless there's something adding moisture, that relative humidity is going to go down. As you go to the evening, the relative humidity is going to increase. Okay. Now, there are two types of hygrometers. Those are the tools that are used to measure humidity. A psychrometer compares the temperature of a wet bulb thermometer and a dry bulb thermometer. So if the air is saturated at 100% relative humidity, then both thermometers read the same temperature. The greater the difference between the thermometer readings, the lower the relative humidity. Here's a sling psych psych psychrometer. Well, here we have, well, here's the bulb of one thermometer. It's dry. And here's the bulb of, another th of the other thermometer wrapped in gauze. So if you dip that in water, room temperature water, so it's moist. So you have your wet bulb and you have your dry bulb. And you sling that around, okay? And the temperature in the wet bulb and the dry bulb, if they're equal, okay, then, okay, hold on, please, previous, then you have 100% relative humidity, okay. The other type of hygrometer is a hair hygrometer, it releases the humidity, it reads the humidity directly. Okay. Now, adiabatic heating and cooling, adiabatic temperature changes occur when air is compressed. Okay. The motion of the air molecules increases. They have less space to travel around, so that air will warm up. And descending air is compressed due to increased air pressure. Okay. If air expands, it will cool. Okay. Rising air expands due to decreasing air, air pressure. And as the molecules are moving around, they get more space to move around. Okay. So the air is going to be cooling. Now the dry adiabatic rate, okay, so there's a rate that, that um, air heats or cools, and the dry adiabatic has unsaturated air. So your relative humidity is less than 100%. So as air rises, it cools at 1 degree Celsius per 100 meters. As air de descends, air is compressed and warms at 1 degree Celsius per 100 meters. Now, if air rises to the point where the air is 100% saturated, we go to the wet adiabatic rate. So that commences at the condensation level. So when the air has reached dew point and starts forming clouds, we'll use the wet adiabatic rate. So the air has reached its dew point, condensation is occurring, and latent heat is being released. Heat released by con condensing, con condensing water reduces the rate of cooling. So the rate is, tends to drop down to about half a degree Celsius per 100 meters. So it's going to cool or warm at half the speed as the air would when it's dry. Here's our diagram. So this little volume of air, pocket of air, is going to be rising. As it rises up, it's going to, going to lose 1 degree Celsius um, 
but there we go, 10 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters in this case. Once it hits the dew point, it's going to start cooling down at a slower rate at 5 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. Orographic lifting. Okay, so when you have like mountains or high terrain as barriers, then you have orographic lifting. And this can result in a rain shadow desert. Okay. Uh, frontal wedging, cool air acts as a barrier to warm air. So the fronts are part of a storm system or called mid, uh, middle latitude cyclones. Okay. And convergence where air is flowing together and rising in low pressure. Then localized convective lifting occurs when unequal surfaces and heating, surface heating causes pockets of air to rise because of their buoyancy. So first the orographic lifting. We have winds coming off the ocean. Okay. And when you reach tall mountains, that air is going to be lifted up. It's going to cool at the dry adiabatic rate and then at the wet adiabatic rate and form clouds. And at some point it's going to start precipitating. So all, most of that moisture is going to be dropped out of the air. When it crosses over the top of the mountains, it's going to start to descend. And as the air descends, it's going to warm at the wet adiabatic, well actually at the dry adiabatic rate. And here, so all the precipitation is really going to fall on this side of the mountains, and this side of the mountains will be a rain shadow desert. Frontal wedging, you have a cold front coming through, so it's lifting up the warm air. As it cools down to dew point, it's going to form clouds and precipitation. That's our orographic lift. Condensation, water vapor in the air changes to a liquid and forms dew, fog, or clouds. Water vapor requires a surface to condense on. Possible condensation surfaces on the ground can be the grass, a car window, etc. Uh, possible condensation surfaces in the atmosphere are called condensation nuclei. So particles of dust or smoke. Okay? Ocean salt crystals, which serve as hygroscopic nuclei, they're water seeking. Okay? Or they actually want to make much larger raindrops than you get elsewhere. Clouds are made of millions and millions of minute water droplets or tiny crystals of ice. We classify clouds based on their form, their shape. We've got three basic, basic shapes. The cirrus, or high, white, thin clouds. A cumulus, or globular cloud masses often associated with fair weather. Stratus, or sheets or layers that cover much of the sky. So here's some cirrus clouds, they're nice and wispy. Here's our alto cumulus clouds. So cumulus are little globular shapes that also refers to their height. And we'll get to that in a moment. Then here's our cumulus clouds. Okay. Also nice and globular um, cotton puffy clouds. Okay, so the classification based on the height, the higher clouds are cirrus, cirrostratus, and cirrocumulus, or wispy ones. Our middle clouds are the altostratus, the sheet ones, the altocumulus are the, uh, the globular ones, and our low clouds are stratus, which are sheets, our stratus cumulus are those, those globular um, low clouds and nimbostratus are dark sheet clouds that, that are going to typically look like it's going to rain or rainy clouds. Nimbus means rainy. Okay, clouds of vertical development from low to high altitude, so very tall clouds called cumulonimbus clouds. And those are often our rain shower and thunderstorm clouds. Okay, so here's a nice diagram. Here are cirrocumulus, a little very high globular clouds. Here are cirrus clouds, nice wispy clouds. And there are cirrus stratus, or our high sheet-like clouds. In our alto range, we have our alto stratus sheets, our alto cumulus of nice cotton ball puffs. Okay? And our strato, strato le level, like our strato cumulus, our cumulus globular ones, our stratus, and our rainy nimbostratus. And here's our cumulonimbus clouds, with the big anvil head. This is the big thunderstorm cloud, though. It starts low, goes all the way up to up into the high regions in altitude. Fog is considered an atmospheric hazard. It's a cloud which its base is at or near ground. Most fogs form because of radiation cooling or movement of air over a cold surface. Types of fogs. Fog caused by cooling or advection fog. Warm, moist air moves over a cool surface. Radiation fog, Earth's surface cools rapidly, forms during cool, clear, calm nights. Upslope fog, humid air moves up a slope. Adiabatic cooling occurs until you reach dew point and fog starts to form. 
Evaporation pods, steam pod, cool air moves over warm water and moisture is added to the air. So there again, reaching dew point. So water is very steaming appearance. Frontal fog or precipitation fog forms during frontal wedging when warm air is lifted over colder air. Rain evaporates to form fog. Cloud droplets. Now precipitation, cloud droplets less than 20 micrometers in diameter and and these cloud droplets fall incredibly slow. So it's a typical rain droplet, very small. Now how, how do these droplets form? Well, when the Bergeron process, temperature in the cloud is below freezing. So ice crystals collect water vapor. Large snowflakes form and fall to the ground or melt during the ascent and fall as rain. Okay. So here we have our condensation nuclei, extremely tiny. Now water vapor will condense on the condensation nuclei to form nice small cloud droplets. Okay. Now here is a nice larger cloud droplet. Okay. Okay, typical raindrop is two, two millimeters in diameter. So as these are falling, they bump into each other and aggregate to form larger raindrops. Now when um, snow forms, we have the Bergeron process, where here we have water molecules here, and they bump into each well, well, they start freezing to form ice crystals, and they'll bump into each other, forming larger and larger um, ice crystals from nice intricate snowflakes. Okay. Collision coalescence process. Warm clouds with large hygroscopic condensation nuclei, so the ocean salts like here in Florida, form large droplets. Okay, so if you moved Florida from somewhere else and you're surprised at how big the water droplets are, this is why. The hygroscopic condensation nuclei causes large droplets. The droplets collide with other droplets during their descent. It's very common in the tropics. Okay, so here, here a large cloud droplet. As it's falling, it's bumping into more cloud droplets, forming larger and larger cloud droplet. It gets too large, it may break apart, and still fall as fairly large raindrops. Okay. Forms of precipitation, rain and drizzle. Rain droplets are at least half a millimeter in diameter. Drizzle droplets are less than half a millimeter in diameter. Snow can be in ice crystals or aggregates of ice crystals. Sleet and glaze. Sleet is a wintertime phenomenon. Small particles of ice will fall. And then um, sleet occurs when warm air overlies colder air. And the rain actually freezes while it's falling. Now glaze or freezing rain, so the ground's really cold. And when that water hits the ground, then it, it forms ice. And the black ice is so dangerous to travel in. It's freezing, freezing rain. Hail, hard round pellets. They're, they're form concentric shells of ice. Most diameters range from one to five centimeters. They form those large cumulonimbus clouds with violent up, up and down drafts. Layers of freezing rain are caught in the up and down drafts in the cloud. Pellets fall to the ground and become too heavy. Also, rime forms a cold surfaces. It's freezing of super cold fog or cloud droplets. Okay, now measure precipitation. Rain is the easiest one to measure. Okay, we use a, a standard rain gauge. It uses a funnel to collect and conduct rain. Um, cylindrical measuring, measuring marks on, on the tube measures rainfall in centimeters or inches. So here's our little rain gauge. We have a funnel. Okay, it's collecting rain. And here we can measure um, how many inches of rain. Um, we have many, um, there are many rain gauges that are set up with little tipping buckets. So when the tipping bucket fills up, it'll tip over and pour the rain into a funnel, I mean into a tube. But there'll be like, but there'll be like a little computer, it's counting how time, how many times that tipping bucket tips over, the tips over and empties its half an ounce or ounce of rain. And that may travel by telemetry, okay, to a government agency who's collecting that rainfall data. That's how uh, we don't have to actually go out and, and look at how much rain is, has been collected uh, every time we have our system set up on telemetry. Snow has two ways to measure. You might measure the depth of snow. You hear frequently, oh, 10 or 12 inches of snow fell last night. Okay, that's the depth. You can also convert it to its water equivalent. Gen generally, 10 snow units equals one water unit. This varies widely. Radar is also used to measure the rate of rainfall.